Up next, let's talk about cloud services, specifically Microsoft's Azure. So what we've been doing all throughout this class is running virtual machines on top of our own infrastructure. So if you look at the left-hand side of my screen, you have your own facility, your on-premises hosting facility, your, your server room or your data center. And in that server room or data center down at the bottom of the stack, you have your physical server, you have your network devices, you have storage devices maybe to store VHDs. On top of that server, you run an operating system, Windows Server. On top of that, you run your virtualization software, Hyper-V. On top of that, you create your virtual machine, and then your virtual machine has its own operating system and then runs its own applications or services. Now, when you do that in your own data center, everything in that stack is your responsibility. You create it all, you purchase all the equipment, you maintain it all, you upgrade it all, you update it all, it's all on you. If you wanted to put a virtual machine though in Azure, then Microsoft will provide the physical server, the networking devices, the storage. They'll provide the host computer with a host operating system, and they'll provide Hyper-V to you, okay? They'll do everything below my dotted line. If you look at the right-hand side of the screen, with infrastructure as a service, Microsoft provides the infrastructure as a service you pay for. You create the virtual machine. Now it's your virtual machine. That'll be your responsibility, okay? You're the one who's gonna update and upgrade your virtual machine, uh, but everything below that dotted line, you don't have to worry about. When the host computers get old, Microsoft replaces them. You don't even know that they did it. They just you know, move your VM to another host and replace the hardware. When they need to update hosts, they update the hosts. Again, you don't even know that they did it. They move your VM to another node in the cluster. They update that host, move the VM back. Okay, everything below that dotted line is Microsoft's responsibility. All right, some advantages of doing things this way is you have less maintenance. I think I just pretty well described that, right? If Microsoft is providing the infrastructure, then you don't have to maintain your own infrastructure. This will likely be cheaper than running VMs in your own data center. Now, you should always price it out just to be sure, okay? But it should have a less, ex a less expensive TCO or total cost of ownership. Okay, when you factor in the price or the, the, uh, the cost of all the equipment that you're gonna run in your data center, all the maintenance time, the electricity, the square footage space for your server room to store those servers, the air conditioning costs, right? When you factor in all the costs of running those servers in your own data center, you might find that using Azure as your host infrastructure, and you just put your VMs out there in the cloud, in that scenario, it's usually cheaper. There's a pricing calculator you can use to check it out. If you just Google the words Azure pricing calculator, you'll find it right away, and you can price out how much it would cost to run a virtual machine in Azure. And you can compare that against your own costs and decide if it makes sense from the budget perspective uh, you know, to move your VMs in Azure. Some other advantages is that you can create VMs at any time. There's basically unlimited capacity out there. And so sometimes you get into situations where your own data center is pretty well maxed out. In order to make more VMs, I have to buy more equipment. Uh, but when you create things in Azure, you kind of have an unlimited supply of equipment that you can use at any time. It makes you very agile. You can create a VM at any time. And you just pay for what you use, okay? Uh, the way this works is when you put a virtual machine out in Azure, Microsoft measures the CPU usage of that virtual machine, the storage space usage, the, uh, the memory usage, and the bandwidth usage, and then they basically just bill you for what you use. Okay, those Azure VMs, it should be noted, could only use VHD files, not VHDX. But those VHD files have a maximum size of 32 terabytes in Azure. In, in Hyper-V, uh, VHD files are limited to two terabytes. When you create virtual machines inside of Azure, you can use premium storage or standard storage. Okay, when you choose premium storage, Microsoft will take your VHDs for your VMs and store them on solid state drives with great performance. If you pick standard storage, they'll use regular hard drives to store your VHDs. It's cheaper, but doesn't offer the same performance level. They have a vast image library. When you create a virtual machine inside of Azure, you can create it from a template that already has software installed inside. 
Okay, so you don't have to waste a lot of time installing operating systems and applications maybe inside your virtual machine. If there's already an image out there in their image library that has that software, you can just say, make a VM using this template and the software will be pre-installed in the VM for you. When you create VMs in Azure, Microsoft has data centers all around the world, all around the United States, Europe, Asia. They have data centers all around the world and you get to pick where, which data center you want your virtual machine to be stored in. We call that the region. Typically, you want to pick a region that's fairly close to you geographically to minimize lag time or latency when your users try to communicate with that VM. We have availability sets in Azure. Same thing as those anti-affinity class names we covered in another lesson. Uh, that's the idea where when I place my VMs in Azure, I want Azure to put my VMs maybe on different hosts. That way, if one host fails, all my VMs wouldn't go down at the same time. We additionally have availability zones. That will not only split my VM up rather than just splitting it between separate hosts, it'll actually split it up between separate facilities. So imagine that I create three domain controller VMs. I want these three domain controller VMs to be stored inside of Azure, but I want those VMs, I never want those three VMs to go down at the same time. So we could split those VMs up between three separate host computers, but imagine I split those VMs up between three separate facilities. Okay, the three VMs are on three different host computers in three different buildings. Okay, and then it would make it even less likely in the case of a major power outage or something like that, that all three of my VMs would go down at the same time because only one of those three buildings might be affected. Let's go into the portal and check it out real quick. If you've never seen it, this is called the Azure portal. It's just portal.azure.com. Of course, you have to have an Azure account to access it. And when I go to portal.azure.com, if I go down here to virtual machines, I can create a virtual machine. Okay, I'm gonna choose which region I wanna place the virtual machine in. These are those locations around the world. Um, I happen to be in Denver, Colorado right now. And so I'm gonna pick central US, which is in Iowa, which isn't too far from where I'm located, but you would pick a region that's close to you. I put in a name for my virtual machine. I put in a resource group, that's just the container, uh, it's like a folder uh, in which the virtual machine will be stored. And then here's those availability sets or availability zones. Okay, so those are the options that would make sure that when I create my VMs, those VMs don't all end up on the same host, okay? I could create multiple VMs, add them to the same availability set, and then Microsoft will spread those VMs out within their data center. That's availability set. With availability zone, the zone they'll actually split those VMs up between separate facilities. Uh, I think I'm just gonna leave that turned off. And then here's that image library I was talking about. So when you create a virtual machine, uh, I could create a Windows 10 VM, Server 2016. We see lots of Linux flavors there. If I click on Browse, there's hundreds of images out here to choose from with different operating systems and different applications pre-installed. That's really nice. I think I'll just do a Server 2019 VM. Um, I get to choose the size of the VM. How much processing power and how much memory do I want to allocate? I'll do two CPU with eight gig of RAM. You can see what that's going to run me uh, per month to run that virtual machine. I'll put in a username and a password. All right, so when the Windows VM gets created, I think I made a typo on one of those. Let me try that again. All right, now it's happy. And so this username and password will be used um, to access the virtual machine once it's been generated, okay? This will basically be the admin account for the virtual machine. Once the VM gets generated, I'll be able to log on with these credentials. Once I log on with those credentials, then I could take the virtual machine and join it to the domain if I like, um, you know, and we could, you know, have uh, our regular domain accounts accessing that VM. But at least initially, this will be the account that gets me in. Let's move on to the next screen. And here I get to choose what kind of storage I want. I'm gonna go with the cheap one, standard HDD. So my VHD files that are being generated for my virtual machine will be stored on this kind of physical disk inside of Microsoft's data center. If I want better performance, I could pick one of the higher tiers. If I wanna give my virtual machine additional VHD files, I can do that down here. When I go to networking, the virtual machine is gonna be added to what we call a VNet. 
And within that VNet, a subnet. And the IP address will automatically be assigned to my VM from that subnet. All right, now that's good enough. I'm gonna go ahead and create the VM now, but I just wanna call out that there are many other options available to you. You can set up virtual machines with a load balancer in front. You can control what we call a network security group, which is a traffic filter that allows you to control what kind of traffic is allowed in or out of your VM. We have lots and lots and lots of settings and options available to us, but I'm gonna go ahead and let it create the VM now. Okay, so the virtual machine is now generating. Uh, virtual machines, in my experience, in Azure usually take about two or three minutes to generate, and so we'll, go, we'll kind of let that run and we'll come back when it's done. Okay, it looks like the virtual machine, machine is now generated. I'm gonna go ahead and click on go to resource and there we can see the virtual machine that I just built. It's currently running. There's buttons here that I can use to restart or stop the VM or delete the VM. Let's try connecting to the VM just to make sure it works. When you connect to the VM, it uses remote desktop to do it. Downloads a little file. I'll go ahead and click on the little file once it finishes downloading and it opens the remote desktop tool on my computer. I have two monitors here at home, so it popped up on my other screen. But there you can see uh, it's connecting to the virtual machine that's out there in the cloud. I'm gonna go ahead and connect to it. It's gonna ask me to log on. I'm gonna provide the credentials that I set up when I built the virtual machine. Try that again. All right, now that I finally typed the credentials in correctly, there's the VM. All right. So this is a virtual machine that's actually hosted in the Azure cloud. It's somewhere in the state of Iowa. It's logging on right now. Uh, and we'll see that once it finishes logging on, it's a server 2019 virtual machine. So this is kind of the future, all right? Uh, a lot of people are already doing this, um, but a lot of organizations are still running things on-prem, but this Azure idea of running virtual machines in the cloud is growing in popularity. And so it's something you might want to seriously consider, uh, at least for some of your VMs, if not all of them, all right? Uh, so that is just a quick look at Microsoft Azure. We'll wait for that virtual machine to finish logging on just to verify that it works. All right, and there we are. So now we have our virtual machine running server 2019 inside of the Azure cloud.